Today's presenter, Russell Jackman, is a graduate of the McGeorge School of Law, University of Pacific, and was admitted to the State Bar of California in June of 1994. He has been vice chair of the California State Bar's Law Practice Management and Technology Committee and a member since 1996. He works specifically with law offices and attorneys that need to get the most out of their legal technology and creates PowerPoint presentations for opening statements, direct examinations, and closing statements to be used in court and can work with attorneys directly to filter their documents and images so that they have the most powerful visual presentations possible. He also works with law offices and solo attorneys to upgrade their older systems to new ones, troubleshooting existing setups and training attorneys and staff on Microsoft programs. He is available for remote access consulting on technology related issues. So please feel free to contact him at any time. Hello, this is Russell Jackman. Um, and I'm speaking for the Center for Continuing Education. And today's topic is ethical issues, pro bono representation, help the profession, help others. And, um, uh, you know, I, I want this lecture to be informative and hopefully somewhat inspiring without being preachy or guilt inducing because I think a lot of times that is sort of the angle of a lot of pro bono um, uh, approaches is to sort of guilt attorneys into doing it and and playing you know uh, the the violin for them and and the sob story and all of that and while that's part of what makes pro bono happen and and work it's not all about that and and that's in fact why I think. There needs to be a greater discussion as to helping to motivate people to do more uh, pro bono work. And so uh, that's a lot of what this talk is about. Okay. So um, the uh, ABA model rule 6.1 is sort of the backbone of all the states that, that have pro bono requirements and there are pro bono requirements in every state. And when I say pro bono, requirement it's not necessarily the kind of thing where they're going to put you in jail if you don't do pro bono you know that's not or they'll fine you or something along those lines it is something that they talk to as a moral and logical obligation for uh what attorneys need to do to uh, uh give back to their profession and one of the not to be uh, a, a self endorser, but one of the talks that we have in our um, series, and one of the ones that I've done prior to this talk, is a talk on um, civility and attorneys and uh, <clears throat> online civility. <clears throat> and one of the things that I mentioned is that the image of attorneys through the media and through just uh, TV, movies, books, you know, everything from badly written John Grisham novel to badly made John Grisham movie uh, uh, has a uh, this tinge to it that lawyers are underhanded, sneaky, double dealing, uh, skirt the law types, um, overcharging clients and underperforming work, um, uh, always trying to cut corners, that sort of thing. And, and that negative image is not only fostered by attorneys that, that are put in the limelight for violating the law, but also just by the very nature of how the bar works. For instance, the California State Bar really stopped being an entity to help attorneys so much as it turned into a policing organization to uh, uh, protect the public from attorney malpractice. And now its major focus is going 
against attorneys for malpractice rather than actually helping attorneys become better attorneys by teaching them things and having spar bar sponsored programs. And so one of the things that helps is the idea if attorneys were to provide more pro bono service, underrepresented would the, the people who are underrepresented in the law would see a more positive image of the legal world. And that's why the ABA model rules have created this framework, which they believe would help not only uh, the public with uh, getting legal services that they need, but also the legal world itself by improving its image. So model rule 6.1 says that every lawyer has a professional responsibility to provide legal services to those who are unable to pay. Lawyers should aspire to render at least 50 hours of pro bono public legal services per year. Fulfilling this responsibility, the lawyer should provide a substantial majority of the 50 hours of legal services without fee or accept expectation of fee to persons of limited means or charitable, religious, civic, community, governmental, and educational organizations in matters which are designed primarily to address the needs of persons of limited means. So looking at this, we can see there is an, certainly an attempt to put a number on those hours so they just don't let that flip by and say, do whatever you can. Um, but certainly other states have fewer hours that they list in the ABA model rule. I believe Florida is an example of one that um, uh, only asks for 20 hours. And even then, not every attorney complies with that. So, um, you know, and I think the 50 hours gets to be daunting um, for a lot of attorneys, unless they realize that really what you're talking about is about one hour a week per year, you know, um, uh, or, you know, every couple of weeks, giving a couple of hours worth of assistance to those that are needed or say four hours a month kind of thing would at least give you 48 hours of pro bono public services. And I think, you know, a little bit of extra work here, a little extra work there, and you get your 50 hours. So mathematically, it's not the largest part, but then some people go, oh, 50 hours, I'd have to work a full week, you know, and then then some, you know, a 50 hour week if I did that, you know, I'd never be able to do that. So they they see the number, they get scared of it, and they don't do any at all. And that doesn't really help so much. And and they when they say that there's a lot of wiggle room when you uh talk about persons of limited means or charitable, religious, civic, community, governmental, and educational organizations um, that are designed primarily to address the needs of persons of limited means. So that in itself can create a lot of arguments, as I think you might understand, where certain entities would claim that they are providing services to uh, the needs of limited persons of limited means. And yet others would say they are not, or that it's too partisan or it's too narrow of a focus, or um, that those people aren't as of limited means as anticipated. And so that is sometimes where, you know, you have, and there's no real clear, especially because you're talking each state is their own arbiter of, of the law itself, you know, of, of what pro bono is. Um, well, there isn't one law that's going to go universally, even though this is an ABA model rule and states are supposed to create their rules based on these guidelines. Not all of them follow this exact route. Um, and then the definition also talks about providing additional services through 
the delivery of legal services at no fee or substantially reduced fee. Okay, again, another uh, a, another term that is up to interpretation and a little bit of arguments between um, uh, individuals that when you have something that is uh, substantially reduced fee, what is substantially reduced fee and are some places like inflating what their prices would be, what their fees would be, so that they could give a reduced fee that really isn't as reduced as it might seem. Uh, 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 and then uh, organizations seek, seeking to secure and protect civil rights, civil liberties, or public rights, charitable, religious, civic, community, governmental, and educational organizations matters uh, in furtherance of their organi organizational purposes where the payment of standard legal fees would significantly deplete the organization's economic resources would otherwise be inappropriate. And then a delivery of legal services at a substantially reduced fee to persons of limited means or participation in activities for improving the law, the legal system, or the legal profession. So that is another way if people don't want to necessarily be involved in uh, 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 clients, they they don't have a a a lot of experience, say in civil law or criminal law, in 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 a like landlord tenant sense or a DUI sense or whatever to help out indiv indigent individuals, or they just don't want to work with those kind of people. They could still get involved, and, and we'll talk later about different ways that you can find involvement that is pro bono still helps improve the law and legal system, but doesn't mean you have to go to court and represent, you know, homeless people or, uh, you know, you have to uh, uh, do immigration law. There's, there's certainly a wide variety of ways that you can help. We'll talk about that. In addition, a lawyer should voluntarily contribute financial support to organizations that provide legal services to persons of limited means. So examples of what does not qualify as pro bono, that is providing legal free, uh, providing free legal assistance to friends and relatives who are not indigent, and it's, that's not considered pro bono. Providing free legal assistance to charitable, community, governmental, or educational organizations in matters that are not designed to primarily address the needs of persons of limited means, where the organization's economic resources would not be depleted, but were to pay standard fee. So that's sort of that weird wiggle line area, which again, cannot find any sort of national law that is out there that, that gives a cutoff saying X percentage would be of limited, it shows that this is where the economic resources would be depleted by paying attorneys certain amounts um, of a reduced fee and what the right amount of reduced fee is or what the right percentage of reduced fee is it 50 percent is it 75 percent you know these are all things that are not standardized and there isn't really an easy way to say in any particular situation what a a truly reduced fee percentage would be looked upon as a positive or negative amount uh, for depleting the resources of a particular uh, organization or uh, group. If a paying client is unable to pay for legal services, that bad debt does not count as pro bono as it's earning expected compensation at the outset of the representation. Again, another situation that could, you know, lead to arguments, but that if a paying client doesn't pay, then the ruling is that that would not be pro bono then, just because you don't get paid. It's because you intended not to get paid or you intended to get paid a reduced fee. Um, uh, if you were uh, uh, 
if you did this representation from the outset. They don't let you go retroactively and decide whether something after the fact, when you were going to rep have yourself representing them for a standard rate, become pro bono because the uh, client didn't pay. And then uh, even if a service is for pay, even if identified as affordable, and services is provided on a sliding fee scale to persons of low or moderate income, do not qualify as pro bono. Again, that is an unfortunate, you know, question as to where the line is drawn exactly on that. So whether something's affordable or whether it's a reduced fee, significantly reduced fee is, you know, or a sliding fee scale is not so helpful as far as like what the guidelines are. Um, but they are, they do want to be inclusive and allow as many actions as they can to be pro bono that are positive, such as individual and class representation, the provision of legal advice, legislative lobbying, administrative rulemaking, free training or mentoring to persons who are of limited means. And so they do want to be expansive as far as who they include, because they're, they do want to encourage people to do these things. They do want to get attorneys to participate in the actual, you know, running and functioning of the legal system itself by by getting attorneys to be involved in legislation. If they didn't, basically, what what and it's the truth. If they didn't really put this out there, a lot of attorneys probably wouldn't be doing it. They would, you know, blow it off and they would say that this isn't for me and you know what's in it for me and. Um, so it's it's good to find ways, or it was good for uh, uh, the uh, legal profession through what we have here, you know, in in, in these uh, with the, the the pro bono attempt is to sort of get people back into the running of the profession and the administration of the profession without. Uh, uh, the state bar having to hire people to do those things and to, to um, uh, necessarily be as insular on itself it wants the profession to handle its own and mostly through a pro bono basis because then you don't have a financial incentive you have people doing it because they actually want to see this change not because there's money in it um the survey was done by Esquire Solutions here, um, and uh, they were asking about factors that would enable more attorneys to provide pro bono legal services. And the majority, well, first of all, 28% was the majority, but, but of the ones that were of a common thread, 24% said a better selection of pro bono cases that match my interest, which is true. People want to help in the area in which they're strongest, and they want to be able to make it if they're going to volunteer out, you know, and it's they want to fight in something they believe in. I mean, you would not want to have someone who had a loved one killed by a drunk driver, a friend killed by a drunk driver representing uh, indigent people in DUI cases, you know, that you just don't want to match people up and stuff that's really opposite of what they're comfortable with. And, and so, but, you know, pro bono cases are where you find them. Not everybody's going to have, you know, a wonderful or perfect case for them, which is, again, why it's good to be, look into pro bono service with different groups and organizations that you know 
are focused on things that, that you um, uh, uh, also believe. In. Now, 20% said the lower billable hour requirement would probably be more incentive for them to, 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 to start doing it. They're intimidated by the 50 hour suggestion or 20 hour suggestion or whatever their state is. Uh, better access to pro bono cases, 16%, and a larger firm pro bono budget. So, in other words, when uh, firms send people out to do pro bono, they're still paying them their full hourly rate while uh, uh, charging only the clients the, the significantly reduced rate. So, the attorney themselves isn't losing personal money by the pro bono. It's the firm making the investment. So the attorney is going out there and doing the work, but not getting less money for it. It's the firm that gets less money based on, you know, the, the, the budget that it has uh, uh, set out for pro bono cases. So, and then 28 is still a big number. I mean, it's almost a third of the, uh, of the, and it's well over a quarter of the of the respondents um, that are talking about other reasons, and it, it gets very esoteric why people don't do it, or why they 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 can't do it, or why they feel they shouldn't. Legal services can be rendered to individuals to or to organizations such as homeless shelters battered women's centers, food pantries that serve those of limited means. The term governmental organizations can include, is not limited to public protection programs, sections of governmental or public sector agency. So um, uh, things such as um, uh, uh, child welfare and adoption services um, uh, to, you know, uh, helping, uh, People who are uh, trying to, you know, get naturalized with the United States, or or uh, educational um, programs uh, for English as a second language. These are all areas where attorneys can help these organizations with their day-to-day -day legal concerns and help smooth out issues that they're having. They all have them, you know, whether you know. Uh, uh, a, a, a group or organization happens to have a lease problem with, with where they're renting out their their office or whether they just need a look over on their contracts of you know what they're paying for for certain bills or maybe there there's someone that's supposed to you know provide services to them that hasn't provided services or someone that's supposed to pay them for a uh, 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 particular service they've provided, they haven't paid them. So, you know, uh, they can always use lawyers in instances like that. And you don't necessarily have to do it for one organization the entire time. You could work for one of these places for a couple of hours, you know, in a month, then switch to a different organization and do another few hours per month. So you don't have to, you can compile them in different ways or say maybe do, you know, 20 hours of representation by court stuff and another 20 hours, 20 to 30 hours of mentoring uh, for, you know, people and sort of mix it up so you're not doing one particular thing that, that burns you out on doing this sort of charity. Work. Legal service, uh, uh, services the the uh, services rendered cannot be considered pro bono if, it's, if an anticipated fee is uncollected. The award of statutory fee in a case originally accepted as pro bono is allowed. So that is one kind of loophole that is there for um, uh, earning money while you're doing pro bono is that while you're not being paid by the client for this the other side is fine and needs to to pay out the attorney for that or it's something that is offered by the government 
um, as part of a uh, part of the uh, standard statutory fees, then you can accept that it's because it's the client that's not paying. You can get money from other sources during the your pro bono representation. Basically, it is allowed under most circumstances, especially you know in the case of statutory fees. Uh, lawyers uh, agree to and receive a modest fee for furnishing legal services to persons of limited means. Participation in Judicare programs, acceptance of court appointments, which the fee is substantially lower or below a lawyer's usual rate. So again, we get into that gray area where they say that they are okay with earning some money for pro bono, but the fee has to be substantially lower. Again, leaving enough room for interpretation as to what substantially lower truly is. The system values lawyers engaging in activities that improve the law, legal system, or the legal profession. So serving on bar association committees, serving on boards of pro bono or legal services program, taking part in law day activities, acting as a continuing legal education instructor, yay me, yes, yes, you can stand up and take a bow, mediator or an arbiter, or, and engaging in legislative lobbying to improve the law, the legal system, or the profession are a few examples of the many activities considered to be a pro bono value. So. I here am doing my deed by being a legal education instructor and helping to explain to you what pro bono representation is all about. Therefore, I myself am gaining pro bono credit for my participation here with you today. But you know, it's it's there there are a lot of other ways to get involved. Law schools and bar associations are a great source for different events that you can get involved in um, or to get you introduced to groups that are on campus that are looking for law students to be involved. But you could also get involved in too, especially as a mentor and someone who's an actual attorney, um, giving the perspective to law students um, from an attorney's perspective, uh, they would find that really valuable. So if you are really interested in uh, 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 getting involved in that part, you can look at certain law schools that are having law days. Um, you can look at um, even when there are, you know, uh, community events. I know COVID-19 has sort of put a kibosh on it, but but certainly when we start having outdoor events and festivals, things like that, again, there are, you know, people that have fair booths and, and groups that they put together to uh, buy charitable services. And that's a way to meet those people, get to know them and, and realize that that's, you know, so when you'd like to represent and be, be a positive um, environment, then, once you can do that, you can usually work a lot of that into your pro bono representation. I don't feel that the uh, bar associations are too picky as to what what constitutes pro bono representation for the most part, because they don't really enforce that too much as far as, uh, 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 you know, going and, and, and putting people you know, on the pillory and finding them and suspending their license because they didn't do any pro bono work. But it's one of those things, if you do have problems with the state bar, having a record of being a pro bono attorney in your past works in your favor. It can help you in fighting off discipline charges. And just from a different perspective, I do know someone that is working through a disciplinary charge right now from the state bar on something that was very obscure that he did not intentionally violate, but the state bar is saying he did. And it's been a really tough fight for him. And, you know, they are talking about like full on suspension of a license or 
maybe not allowing him to practice for a year. Um, and that, that is a really tough spot to, 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 to be placed in. Some of the things that he's using to help mitigate that, those allegations has been his pro bono work. And he has substantial pro bono hours, fortunately. So he's hoping that that will show well on his record and allow him to, you know, get past what really was a single mistake that I think is being, you know, overblown by the state bar and maybe some people who have an agenda to make his life difficult when he has been a positive member of the community, has been someone who's devoted many hours to pro bono work and improve that by uh, the places that he's been involved in. So don't think that, you know, oh, doing all this pro bono work, that'll never help. Plus, right, as we'll see later, you can get public recognition for the pro bono work that you do. And there are also people who are part of the pro bono process that you are involved in that may be able to look positively on your involvement and offer you business opportunities that down the road that you would have never been able to imagine, but you have now gotten some access to because you did pro bono work. Can't say it's going to work for that's going to be the case for everybody, but you also can't say that that's never ever going to possibly happen. Now, there may be a time when there, it's not feasible for lawyers to engage in pro bono services. Um, there is a way to discharging the pro bono responsibility by providing financial support to organizations and providing legal, free legal services to persons of limited means. So, so if you basically put your money where your mouth is, if you contribute what you would be making for the hourly basis for 50 hours worth of work to an organization um, that can do these sort of things in your place, then that is also considered meeting your pro bono requirement. Such financial support should be reasonably equivalent to the value of the hours of service that would have been otherwise provided. So here's an example, though, of a Florida pro bono, which says in the early 90s, the state Supreme Court ruled that Florida attorneys um, should perform at least 20 hours worth of pro bono work or contribute at least $350 to a legal aid program. Um, the goal is not mandatory. Um, but they are, Florida attorneys are required to report their pro bono hours and contribution. Uh, the number of attorneys licensed in Florida has grown. The number of hours donated has been relatively unchanged. And so um, uh, the author was saying that the legal community in Jacksonville has always been generous with their volunteer time and fundraising raising efforts. And they're very grateful to the uh, people that are providing advice, brief services, representation, mentorship, and financial contributions on behalf of low-income residents. Um, and then we're seeing just the need for pro bono attorneys growing by the numbers, even though we've seen a lot, as you can see on the right, it shows that 5 million hours plus been donated by 128 firms in 2018. And then overall, as across the board, 76.5% of attorneys engaged in pro bono work, which is a pretty good number. That's three out of four attorneys are doing it, but it's also a number that could stand to have improvement. And the 3.8 total billable hours were pro bono work. Again, if it were more like you know, 85% or 90% and billable hours were more like around 5%, we'd see an even greater impact of what pro bono work does for the underrepresented, upper, underrepresented uh, legally in, in America. And uh, during the exceptional time that COVID-19 pandemic has, has happened, there have been since March of 2020, there have been lots of uh, uh, 
challenges for unemployment, eviction, foreclosure, and bankruptcy. And those sensitive areas are almost always in need of pro bono representation. So um, uh, uh, if that's an area in which you, the listener, has experience and you're looking to uh, be involved in um, uh, uh, pro bono work, now is a great time to get involved in this area. Only lawyers have the skills and knowledge necessary to secure access to justice through the legal system. And so that's one of the other issues that, that we have is that the system is so difficult to navigate. It's so Byzantine that it's not easy for the average person to even begin to approach the the court system and know what to do. Some people are not even aware that they have rights that are being violated or that they can sue for certain things. And so just by even giving people the knowledge that they have these rights can be make a world of difference to them. We'll go on and explain some of that shortly. Um, so nine months equals 35 weeks equals 246 days equals 5,911 hours. That's the time that attorneys have spent doing pro, no, pro bono work for individuals and families in Charlotte this year at the Charlotteville Center for Advocacy. This was in 2019. So you can see that just in some areas, when they take it seriously, there can be thousands of hours given. And every single one of those hours was an hour that was needed by the people that were there at the Center for Legal Advocacy. The, the, you, you can probably ask every single person that was there whether they needed those 5,911 hours. Everyone would probably tell you they needed that and probably more on top of it. For low-income people whose unmet legal needs are well-documented, volunteer attorneys who work with legal services programs have the ability to bridge the gap. Legal services reach out to the low-income communities and let them know about help available. Social services agencies refer those in need to legal service offices. Most low-income residents will not contact a private attorney to ask for pro bono. They will contact a legal services agency. So don't expect people to come to you begging for, pro, for you to give them pro bono hours. It's just too humiliating for them, and they just think that most attorneys are going to wave them off. And a lot of times attorneys, attorneys do because they don't realize the person coming to them is of limited economic means. Whereas when you show up at one of these groups, they know that's your situation. That's why you're there. They know why how to get you in touch with an attorney that is sensitive to those things. And meanwhile, you know, you as the attorney are contacting these groups to give your pro bono hours because you are sensitive to these things. So it kind of works both ways. According to the American Bar Association, at least 40% low and moderate income households experience a legal problem each year. Yet studies show that the collective civil legal aid effort meets only about 20% of the need. So even though 76.5% of attorneys are giving pro bono work, they're not giving enough time. They, they are giving some of their time, but it's not the 50 hours. It's not even the 20 hours. And, and that is something that has to change because if it doesn't change, it lowers the the efficacy of the legal profession itself. It lowers the image of the legal profession. It, it feeds into that attorneys are, are out for themselves. Attorneys are um, only out to pad their own pocket. And that's, that's something that attorneys have to fight. They need to fight because it, that negative image hurts the profession and it hurts the value of the legal degree and the JD and 
and the passing of the bar that you worked so hard to achieve. So let's talk about some positive situations of people who have, you know, done um, some great pro, pro bono work and were written up um, and published for the good work they did. Um, there's a lady named Cindy Watterson, an attorney who specializes in special needs law, volunteers her time to take pro bono limited conservatorship cases, which are protective probate proceedings for individuals diagnosed with a de developmental disability. So she's using her skills with special needs to help people with developmental disabilities in, in, in probate proceedings. So she also uses a Spanish-speaking paralegal, Claudia Kennedy. Watterson takes on as many Spanish-speaking cases as she can because of the difficulty of placing such cases. Work involves meeting with families to determine their needs, drafting petitions, relating pleadings required for conservatorship and probate court, and representing the client in court. And she, she was asked, why did you decide to volunteer on this? She said, my firm practices in the area of special needs law. This involves advocacy for individuals who are diagnosed with de developmental disabilities, such as autism, <clears throat> mental retardation, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, and their family. My partner, Pat Huff, and I are contract attorneys for regional centers, having actually worked on staff for one of the Los Angeles regional centers. Because of our background, I feel compelled to accept as many limited conservatorships from the PLC as we can, especially those cases involve unusual or difficult issues where the families would have difficulty navigating through probate court alone. We find the work rewarding. We're very blessed to work in this area especially. My partner and I, as well as our staff, are committed to assisting families. All of our families experience unique challenges surrounding their child's disability. And they struggle every day to navigate the maze of systems and services necessary to ensure that their child lives a it's very rewarding for me personally when I'm able to leave them for this place. Would you recommend other attorneys volunteering for PLC? I feel strongly that attorneys should offer pro bono services. When I first graduated from law school, the bar recommended that I offer at least 50 hours of pro bono services. I can't say that I meet that goal every year, but by volunteering for PLC and other pro bono agencies, I'm able to work toward that. My personal goal is to maintain a minimum of one pro bono active case at all times. I urge all attorneys to volunteer their services. It's vitally important for our communities to provide legal services to the underserved. It is equally important to ourselves as professionals to pay it forward. What is your impression that PLC does to help the community? PLC does an amazing job of outreach and legal services to our community. I'm always impressed by the quality of intake documentation when I receive a new case. Orange County is very lucky to have this organization. And if you are interested, you can contact attorney Leslie Lindgren from the Orange County area and I listen to this particular seminar. Um, here's another example. There was a girl by the name of Ruby who was taken to, into the legal custody of the Louisiana Department of Children and Family Services due to dependency. Her mother, her mother's parental rights had been terminated, and her father was incarcerated on charges, which he denied vehemently, and which were later dropped. Because she had no legal caretaker, the state requested legal custody place Ruby in the home of a, of a relative. After her father's release from jail, Project's attorney representing Ruby successfully negotiated with the attorney, district attorney a continuance of the child in need of care adjudication give the father time to restore utilities to his home so that both Ruby and her father would be not be burdened with the legal and social stigma of the child welfare case. So this is a situation where somebody who was falsely accused, um, who had rights, would have lost those rights completely and probably just been too intimidated to represent himself in a situation like this, but also couldn't couldn't afford the utilities in this house, so he couldn't really afford an attorney either um, for this. You know, I mean, people, when it's a matter of survival and, and having, you know, power and having heat and, and water, running water, you have to, you can't choose between whether you're going to have an, hire an attorney and 
give that attorney a down payment of thousands of dollars plus court fees and everything else when you know you are just barely making it survival wise. So um, this was an instance where uh, a legal aid was able to provide and pro bono attorney help was able to help Ruby out. Um, here's another instance too. A Midland attorney uh, uh, recognized a uh, uh, this uh, lady by the uh, uh, name of Angela Cole, recognized for second year in a row by the Access to Justice Committee of the State Bar of Michigan for work to support access to justice efforts and providing the pro bono legal services to low income individuals and families. She was listed in 2020 as a lawyer that helps the pro bono honor roll. And that's something that the State Bar of Michigan publishes. Um, and it uh, recognizes a fraction of solo attorneys, small firms, large, large, large firms and corporations provide 30, 50, or 100 plus hours qualifying pro bono legal services. In 2019, Angela provided a combination of 581 pro bono and low bono hours between her private practice as an attorney to affordable legal care, a nonprofit law firm founded by Cole that serves people who do not qualify for free legal assistance with federal programs for the court appointed attorneys who earn too little to afford to pay the full price of, of an attorney. So, 581 hours. So, when people complain, 50 hours is too much. There's someone that did more than 10 times that requirement and uh, got recognized for her efforts. Cole served 98 individuals or families, five organizations that serve low income individuals, 498 reduced hourly peak hours, 83 free hours in 2019. I have a grateful heart to our community, organizations, individuals, and families donated or referred clients to affordable legal. I could not have done this without each and every one of them, the board members for affordable legal care. It was because of their support of so many people and families that had access to affordable legal services. Paul has a well-rounded experience between the court system, private practice, and the corporate world. Spent more than 20 years in the legal field, most of it in leadership or management. He served as a corporate attorney with global responsibility. A private practice attorney, magistrate, attorney referee, and judicial law clerk. She's known statewide as a child advocate and active in the community as a volunteer with both nonprofit and civic organizations. Now, I know that she puts a pretty high, high standard on what, what she has accomplished, and not everybody can do these sort of things, but it also shows what is possible when someone does dedicate. So to the betterment of the world around them through providing um, true le high levels of pro bono service. And obviously, you know, she didn't do it for the fame and for a write-up here, but it's awfully nice to get recognized when you do something with selflessness. So let's talk a little bit about how to get involved. Um, no matter where you live or work, there's a pro bono program will be of interest to you that needs your help. And you can get the uh, information from the link that I have listed down here. Um, uh, or you can go Google search the National Pro Bono Volunteer Opportunities. And you'll find that. Um, and then they'll also have uh, your local state or bar association has a pro bono committee program or program that needs your assistance. And so just by going to your various state websites, state bar websites, or even local bar associations, your city um, or county uh, will have pro bono um, guides and uh, at least a committee that could help give you an idea where you can go to, uh, to contribute. Um, there are legal aid and legal services providers in your community that have pro bono and other programs that would be of interest to you able you to serve the corner community. The American Bar Association has a large number of pro bono programs. And the American Bar Association's Volunteer Legal Project 
BLP, created in 1986 to assist the ABA's lawyer staff in fulfilling professional obligations to perform pro bono service. Over the years, lawyers have provided legal services to a number of indigent clients. It's matters involving bankruptcy, divorce, custody, adoptions, guardianship, public benefits, wills, and other matters. Um, uh, so if you um, are part of the uh, ABA and want to participate in the program, there's a lady by the name of Marissa Levette in contact. Um, and uh, it's, I, I remember the VLP coming into existence. I, I went to law school in 90, I started in 1990. So just started up basically when I went to law school. And I know that it's made a big difference. I know people have been on the VLP and uh, they've made some incredible contacts especially while they were in uh, law school uh, uh, and early in their legal career by doing VLP projects, they were able to network and gain friendships that became significant business contacts later on in, in, in career. Um, and there's also a great need for paralegals, as much as there are for attorneys to uh, get involved in pro bono participation. Um, there's an equally large number of opportunities available for paralegals. Um, then another very big area to get involved in is the ABA's Immigrant Child Advocacy Network. It connects pro bono attorneys with the tens of thousands of unaccompanied uh, immigrant minor children in America who are scheduled for legal proceedings and no right to appointed counsel or other adult representing the child's interests. Now, I know that one thing I'm not supposed to do here is get political. I'm not intending to get political by my statement here, yet it is something that has been a major issue that I've seen, uh, you know, in the last few years is what's been going on at the border. And one of the people that, that has inspired me and what I've watched in her pro bono efforts is an attorney that I know that is an immigration attorney. And she has actually flown down to Mexico, uh, to the border, uh, Texas, and where, you know, the uh, Juarez or, or, or some other border towns that have detainment centers and represented the uh, children and, and tried to reunite them with their parents or trying to reunite the parents with their children. And the level of heartbreak and the um, sadness that is involved in all of this, plus the people who are there legitimately seeking asylum because of the problems in their home country and yet being detained with almost no level of civil rights adapted to their environment is a real problem and very tragic. And what my friend writes in her blogs about going down there and the conditions that she sees people in is something that gives people a lot of motivation to help them. And it's amazing what she's able to do it's amazing what she's able to accomplish. And again, I really admire her efforts for what she does. Um, whether or not you believe in her politically, the fact that she's able to go down there and brave those conditions and work almost nonstop while she's down there, and of course, doing it all for free has been um, truly inspiring. She's done that for the last uh, three years. So. I, I, it, when I think of pro bono and people that I know that have really talked the talk and walked the walk of pro, pro bono, I think about that. Um, and without legal help, these children are unsuccessful in impressing their rights in over 90% of the cases. With the help of a lawyer, these children prevail most of the time. So not everything has to be a quote-unquote liberal agenda project. You can also join up with the Military Pro Bono Project. Um, 
And this one is uniquely focused on pro bono services to active duty military service members, many of whom remain deployed in areas of conflict. You can also um, be involved in a COVID-19 legal response list serve, or you can uh, be part of the National Legal Aid Advocacy Disaster Recovery, um, which has a list of people that need help with COVID-19 cases, uh, but don't have the money, so they, they need pro bono service and, and help. And then the National Disaster Legal Aid Advocacy Center, uh, they have volunteers from nonprofit legal aid organizations, bar associations, pro bono counsel, law firms and corporations, law students, faculty, allied nonprofits working on disaster legal aid. Let's just put it this way. Whether you're a Republican or Democrat, a hurricane doesn't care. You know, a wildfire doesn't care. Um, an earthquake doesn't care. Uh, 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 floods do not care. They happen everywhere. And wherever there's a flood, wherever there's a fire, wherever there's an earthquake, wherever there's um, uh, a tornado or a hurricane, those areas need pro bono assistance. So pretty much no matter where you are at, Whenever there's a disaster, you can see that as an opportunity to get involved and to start providing pro bono help for those afflicted. Now, you're not just going to run out to, you know, where the wildfires are going in California or, or Seattle or whatever and throw your business card around. Um, but by contacting counties where the fire has occurred, letting them know that you want to or the, the bar associations for the counties where, where these fires have occurred, these disasters have occurred, and letting them know that you are available for pro bono assistance for whatever they need or whatever your specialty is, that would go a long way to providing those hours. And let's just face it, there's nowhere where there's a disaster where legal assistance isn't necessary. And then here is a kind of laundry list. I'm not going to go through each one of these. Uh, but you can go through them on your own if you're looking at this podcast. You could press pause and check out all the different associations that that are part of uh, uh, different programs or uh, pro bono that offer different pro bono programs. That probably the most significant one out of this group. There are a lot of them. But the Lawyers Without Borders which is an organization of volunteer lawyers committed to work for rule of law initiatives, human rights work, non-governmental um, organizations. Uh, 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 they are a uh, uh, international human rights movement and pro bono volunteer work. Um, I believe that my friend is involved with the Lawyers Without Borders program the one that, that goes down to uh, uh, help represent the uh, people who are um, uh, being detained for uh, the border uh, situation. Um, but there's just as many different organizations as you can possibly think of. There are those types of needs for pro bono work. It just, it's never something that has a finite end to it or you can say that all the pro bono needs are met. There's always going to be more needs for pro bono work than there will be attorneys to provide that. So by saying, I don't know how to get involved, there's nothing in any of these groups that, that interests me. Um, I, it's too much trouble. I'm too busy. Um, I don't know anything that could help these people. That's not true. There are so many different ways to get involved. And I hope that's something that, that is impressed upon you as we reach an end to this talk. So, um, uh, so as a conclusion, um, there will always be a need for pro, pro bono help in so many different areas. All states suggest between 20 to 50 hours a year. And yes, it's non-enforceable. Yes. It's not something that will 
that will raise your insurance rates or if you don't do it or or someone's going to wake you up at night and shake you by the shoulders and say why have you done your pro bono it's it's not a matter of that but we're all better than that we're not people that that have to be punished to do something good if you don't do something good then you're obviously doing something bad you need to be punished can we not do something for the sake of doing something that's good and we know that it's a positive situation. Can we not give of ourselves without expecting a reward? Can we not help people that are in a disadvantaged situation because maybe one day we may find ourselves in a disadvantaged situation or someone that we love may find themselves in a disadvantaged situation or maybe in the past, someone that we knew or ourselves were in a disadvantaged situation. Many firms do have pro bono budgets. So finding out what your firm has as far as a pro bono budget for each attorney, and finding out what's allotted to you. If you are in a firm for your pro bono budget, a lot of attorneys don't even ask. So they don't even know. And if you know that you're going to get paid for 20 hours a year to do pro bono projects and you're going to get paid your same firm rate, as you would, or maybe 50% your rate or whatever, well, that should give you the incentive to go out and do it. You're not just going to wind up losing money by helping out. You'll still get paid something, or maybe you get your paid your entire, your entire rate um, by going out and helping some. Solo and small firms can still make pro bono productive. For them. And helping the, the, the under and non-represented makes a difference. It's not only as I said, with the image of attorneys, that when you do show that you can help out, that you're not just some lawyer in a three-piece suit that's you know telling people to sign on the dotted line, but it helps move the community forward. It helps people who are stuck. As we just said, we talked about fathers being reunited with their daughters instead of being sent, having their daughters sent into the welfare system. It's 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 people who would not be able to inherit property because they have developmental disabilities and don't speak English, but are still entitled to certain rights under the law, but didn't know they could enforce those things. It's people who have rights to not be evicted um, under COVID-19 or, or not have their jobs terminated or that they have rights uh, 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 to rent places or to 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 uh, be able to 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 get their rent deposit back so whatever you know from COVID-19 those things help the community help everyone as a whole as everyone as people get unstuck legally and can move forward then their lives become more productive people underestimate how difficult people's lives are when they're stuck legally and they know they have rights, but they can't do anything about it, and they are incapable of representing themselves. They don't know where to find an attorney that will represent them for pro bono, and they let those rights expire or are only able to collect on a fraction of those or settle for something that's a fraction of that. That deteriorates people. That is something that lowers the quality of life for people. It lowers the quality of life in the world around. And as I said, it helps the overall image of attorneys. And overall, don't you think that when you're involved in a pro bono situation and you know that you've made a difference, doesn't it make you feel better? I think in this year, 2020, we're all trying to find a way to make ourselves feel better. Maybe by providing some true pro bono service, you have an opportunity to feel better too. That's my talk for today. Thank you for listening.